one morning and all of a sudden you feel free it's because we have been set free that we are free today not by our own power not by our own might not by anything that we've done but by the spirit of the living God turn around and shake three hands on the way to your seat and tell them I am free All right, welcome, hallelujah. This kind of feels like uh, welcome home Sunday. We got a lot of, not a lot, but uh, some folks that haven't been here a while, amen? Let me run through just a couple of announcements. Uh, for you ladies, this Tuesday, I hope some of you, I know some of you are coming. Uh, Elizabeth Pitcher has got the uh, health and fitness, I don't know, what do you call it, workout thing up here? at seven o'clock workout right health and fitness workout for you ladies at seven o'clock up here I, yeah should be magically on the board as I speak here so this is a neat outreach and uh, Elizabeth's in charge of it also this uh, this well this is today we've got the first session of growing kids God's way amen it's today right all right, that's today with uh, Brian and uh, Cassandra Teal. That's at 5 to 6.30 here. So, growing kids God's way. Aaron, come on up for a second. I love coming up here. <laughs> April 5th through the 7th, we're putting together an awesome retreat for the youth. It's called Disciple Now. Uh, and we're looking for host families. And the, th the thing about this retreat is that we're not going to take the youth. We're not going to go a thousand miles away where they can hang out. We're going to be here at the church. It's going to be here. We're going to be discipling them here at the church. And so what we're looking for, we're looking for host families who would be willing to host for two nights, about six to seven youth in their house for two nights. Host families. This is, a, this is an awesome time for the youth to get to know each other and also to grow in their faith in God. So if you're willing to sacrifice, this is going to be an awesome time. It's called Disciple Now. We have a sign-up sheet. <laughs> Whew, I don't have any kids yet, so. <laughs> I don't know why everyone's laughing, but <laughs> we have a sign-up sheet out in the back, if you, want to, if you want to please sign up, that would be awesome. We're looking for some host families who would be willing to sacrifice their time for these kids. It's going to be a great time. I hope we got a lot of pencils back there for signing up people. All right. Clarence, come on up. Praise the Lord. Well, next Saturday morning, we're going to love our neighbors. Y'all heard a little bit about that? We're going to go and, uh, right over here. And last time we went, we covered 200 homes on a Saturday morning. Now, a lot of people are not home, but 
We, do, we always leave a witness on their home. We have a little gift packet here. It's got uh, Gospel of John, a slicky on our church, our services, and all of that. A track by Billy Graham, because everybody recognizes Billy Graham. And then we have a little fly slide in there. It's a little gift. And the idea is, we love you folks. We want to know if you go to church, and if you don't, we have a great church for you uh, to attend. Now, other times, we're going to get in a conversation with people and find out that they have spiritual needs. That's what we're here for. The Great Commission was, go ye, not sit ye. Amen? All right, remember that one. We are to go ye. So, we have a harvest where perhaps 80% of our neighbors attend no church. None this morning. So, we want to reach out. So be here at 9.30 Saturday morning, and we're going to have a great time. Amen. All right. Also, I, I think, I'm not sure of this, I think we've got some people here in the body that are over 55 years old. I've been told that at least. But uh, Barbara Kersey has got a ministry called Young at Heart, and they're going to have uh, this Friday at her house, get this, fajitas and boring games. No, that's board games, board games. No, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. Sorry, board games. I'm sure it's gonna be Monopoly and just great things like that, so you're into that. Should be fun, all right? 55 and up, okay? That's Barbara Kersey's house this Friday. Also, if you are a uh, first or second time visitor, please stand. Remain standing. Please stand. First or second time. There you go. Ah. All right, everybody. Please also fill out the, uh, the visitor card that's attached there. If you don't fill that out, you don't get the little prize inside. Sorry. <laughs> also, We've got some uh, exciting news uh, as far as uh, all new members are exciting to, uh, to welcome, but we've especially got one that's, uh, that's really neat that's come back. That's Irene and Rufus Gabara. Stand up there for a minute, would you? Amen. So we welcome them as a part of the body. One last thing. If you have not signed up, uh, for the uh, Sweetheart Banquet Friday. You need to do that, okay? Of course, the requirement is that you're married or engaged to be married. Not thinking about it, but engaged to be married. And uh, just, just uh, you know, a heads up to you guys, Thursday is Valentine's, okay? So uh, go today. Uh, Wednesday evening, the cards are not good. Thursday, you'll be good to find a card. When you do, you'll be standing about the 20th in line waiting to pay for that card that you found that you don't even like. So go do it today. Today, right? So make sure that you sign up for our Sweetheart Bank. We're going to have a blast. We've got different things planned, a little bit of video, some music. Uh, it's going to be a great time. So sign up, all right? Friday. That starts at what time? 6.30. 6.30. All right. Y'all ready to worship? Let's continue to worship. Come on, stand to your feet. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That doesn't just mean Sunday morning. It means every morning. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's so good to me. I will bless the Lord at all times.
to me. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's good. Come on and tell me how good he's been. He's good. supposed to be doing every minute of every day. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's good. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's good. Yes, he's good. He's good. So good. Real good. Each and every
your prayer today is that your heart's desire Lord come into this place come into this place and change me I'm not praying for revival in this church I'm praying for revival in myself that's where it's supposed to start each and every one of us that is desiring a move of God in this place, in this town, needs to pray that it would start in our own heart. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, Lord, we desire to be holy. Holy, just as you are holy, holy are you, Lord. Nothing else, nothing that this world could offer will ever match the beauty of your holiness. Nothing, nothing that this world could offer will ever match the beauty of your holiness i worship you i worship i worship
lifting your voice when you're in a crowd of people like this it's lots easier it's easier to shout and to dance when everybody around you is shouting and dancing it's when you're in solitude it's when you're in that quiet place in that closet of prayer that you can say I worship not everybody else but me Lord I worship you are holy 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 are you Lord holy are you Lord of your spirit sing with me nothing in this world nothing in this world could offer nothing will ever match the beauty of your holiness there is no thing nothing that this world could offer will ever match the beauty of your holiness one more time we're going to sing I worship I worship I worship you do you mean that this morning I worship I worship all the music except just the voices and sing I worship I worship you one 
more time I worship. I worship. I worship you. Just worship him. Father, we do worship you. Yes. It says your mercies are new every day. It says your grace and your mercy endures forever and ever and ever. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you for the beauty of your holiness. Lord, thank you for the blood of Jesus. It has washed us clean, made us white as snow. Lord, that we can come in a place together and we can sing, joining with the songs of heaven. Holy, holy. And that we worship you. We worship you. Worthy Lord, you are worthy, worthy of all praise, Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, as we sing these songs, we do, Father, we ask you just your Holy Spirit to have your way today. Holy Spirit, come and just freely move. Yes. Lord, we pray for your anointing in this place, Lord God, and your anointing just to flow through RT as he shares the word today, Lord God. Lord, that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. And Father, just, Lord, let us be aware of the atmosphere that we're in today. In the presence of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Why don't you be seated? Ted. It's on the floor over there, Ted. Good morning. The Lord loves a chill forgiver. And if you're giving any monies, cash, and you want a record of it, the ushers will give you an envelope so you record it. And if you have any prayer requests, please take, so, take those prayer requests and write it on there so we can pray in agreement with you. <clears throat> in the book of Luke, there's an awesome scripture about giving. And I want to share with you a little background about this scripture. In Luke 6, 12, it says, Now in those days it occurred that he went up into a mountain to pray and spent the whole night in prayer to God. Mm. That was Jesus Christ. And that same day, he summoned his disciples and selected 12 apostles and he sat them and started to teach his disciples and his apostles and other people that are around him it's basically the Sermon on the Mount and at the end of his teaching he said anybody that adheres to his word is like a man who built a house on a strong foundation if you hearken to his word and obey it, the storms of life will come and you will not fall. And I want to, as a congregation, to confess out loud Luke 6.38 as we take up the offering. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, 
it shall be measured to you again. Be blessed. double duty today. <laughs> uh, Ron Hell was out of town. So I just, you know, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, today is an honor to have RT and Louise with us. And uh, August 5th, and we have Curry and Beverly with us today. <laughs> yes. 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 And you know, uh, uh, August 5th, we had the, the big bash there at the Stafford Center and different people submitted videos and RT and Jack Taylor and uh, uh, Pastor Charles Karen uh, did a video together. And, and uh, so on that Monday, I sent emails to them, letting them, thanking them for that and just letting them know how important their ministries have been to us. And uh, there's nothing that's ended. <laughs> We're... We're moving and building on what Beverly and Curry have done, and, uh, and they're excited about that. And I believe that RT is an, uh, an important relationship to this church, and I'm so thrilled that he is here today to bless us. And so I, I didn't dictate anything for him to do, so just whatever the Holy Spirit lays on your heart. And so uh, welcome, RT. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, I don't know when I felt so honored and affirmed and so glad to be back in a place. I'm just full, full of gratitude, of joy. And um, it was 11 years ago, almost exactly 11 years ago, when I was first here with Jack and Charles. And I think it was the second place we preached, or I preached, after our retirement. Uh, in 2002, and I'm sure we were here in February, uh, and it was, all, I think if I looked in my diary, it's almost exactly 11 years ago. And uh, at that time, nobody in America knew us or ever heard of us, and, uh, but uh, God has blessed us over these uh, 
11 years, and not least is that I get to come back here. Louise and I love coming here. And um, uh, seven years ago, I committed to pray for Curry and Beverly every day. And uh, uh, on this occasion, we renew that covenant to pray for them daily, but we're adding Greg and Linda to the list. So I promise, I will pray for you both every day. And, and Greg, you so honor me. Uh, and uh, Louise and I are thrilled that this relationship uh, doesn't end. You know, there was a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph, and I uh, didn't want to, uh, a successor to Curry that didn't know RT. Uh, but it hasn't worked out and, uh, like that. It could be better. And Curry, you must be proud of him. A wise son makes a glad father. And uh, I think it's a beautiful transition, and I expect great, great things. And, uh, you know, Greg, I don't know how you got Linda. <laughs> you ugly thing. Well, life's not fair. Kerry got Beverly, you got Linda, I got Louise. We've been married 54 years. <laughs> Kerry, how long have you been married to Beverly? Three weeks, three weeks, okay. Well, we'll legitimize the relationship after church and we'll bless it. How long have you married her? They don't know. Fifty years? Curry, I think I'm going to need to counsel you after the service. <laughs> he said it, it, it seems like 60, but it's only 50. And Greg, how long have you and Linda been married? 28, okay. All right. Well, anyway, thank you very much for having us. Uh, I've always been encouraged to bring books here. And... Uh, um, we now sell, when I go places for the last year or two, uh, we sell everything virtually at cost. Everything is $10. It says 15 on the cover, sometimes 18. It's so easy to remember, not here, uh, to make a fortune off of selling books. So if you want any, everything is $10. And uh, what I'm going to do this morning, I, I'm going to preach the third in a trilogy. Some of you will remember my sermon, Total Forgiveness. Uh, which uh, is a book uh, in now about 20 languages, including in China. Uh, the Chinese government, would you believe it, have approved uh, for total forgiveness, and now they're going to do totally forgiving ourselves. Uh, uh, that's the book written for people who know that God forgives them, but they can't forgive themselves. We've all had that problem. I have. Uh, but the third... Uh, is what I will preach on today. It's totally forgiving God. Not that God has done anything wrong. He is guiltless, he's pure, he's perfect. But he allows things to happen which we don't understand. And I have a message this morning that's going to set people free. That's what Freedom Center is all about. And uh, you will be set free today. I promise it. Uh, and this book is just out. I'm delighted that Rick Warren has endorsed the book and, and several others. And so that is available. All right. Would you open your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk? Not easy to find. Let me tell you how to find Habakkuk. Go to the book of Malachi. And uh, Beverly, that, uh, that's the last uh, book in the Old Testament uh, just want to make sure you're awake. Go back to Malachi and count five back. And that's Habakkuk. Not easy to find. And Habakkuk chapter 2. Verse 2. The Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so the herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. 
It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it, it will certainly come and will not delay. Then the next verse says, but the righteous will live by his faith. The Hebrew reads, the righteous will live by his, capital H, God's faithfulness. It's important to remember that Habakkuk said, we will live by the faithfulness of God. And it's a verse quoted three times in the New Testament. Uh, living by his, uh, God's faith and faithfulness. Now turn one page to Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Here's a verse that sometimes I cannot read without coming to tears. Keep in mind it was an, an agrarian society. They didn't have uh, food in freezers like we have. They lived one day at a time. They depended upon rain, they depended upon sun, they depended on good crops. And here's what Habakkuk said. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. May God be pleased to bless the reading and the preaching of this his most holy and infallible word. Brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus by your Holy Spirit to be upon every mind present, that their perception of what I say will be received and applied in the manner you intend. Cleanse my tongue, my heart, that I might be your transparent vehicle to say everything you want said, nothing you don't want said. May this be a moment and a day in which we're changed, never to be the same again. And may this be a word that brings great honor and glory to your name. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. It occurs to me as I speak, I don't say I have word of knowledge, but I just have a feeling that there's someone here that as I speak, you are in the greatest trial of your life. You don't need to come to me and say, I'm the person. I'm not asking you to do that. But I have a feeling there's someone here that right now, as I speak, you are in the middle of the greatest trial you've ever had. If so, this is a word for you. All others can eavesdrop. But keep in mind what I say, because down the road you may need it. Now, why is this word from Habakkuk important? Well, it touches on one of the most common questions asked by all of us, uh, whether you're a Christian, you're not a Christian, whether you're an intellectual type or the simplest mind in Texas. We've all had the same question. Why does God allow evil things to happen? Knowing he's all-powerful and all-merciful, he could at any moment stop the Sandys of this world, the new towns of this world, and the things that have happened in your own life, and you think, Lord, why? He could have stopped that. But for some reason, didn't. Or answer me this question. Why did God create humankind knowing we would all suffer. Can you answer me that question? I remember as a, as a little boy, when I first got a little explosion, exposure to this sort of thing, I come from uh, Kentucky. Now, the fact that I'm from Kentucky, I, I don't want anybody here to be intimidated by that. 
Uh, I've got to keep in mind that uh, you can't help it that you weren't born in Kentucky. And I, I, don't, I don't think I'm better than you. I probably am. I just don't think it. Of course, Louise is from northern Illinois. She's a snob. I come from Kentucky, Ashland, Kentucky. I remember as a little boy in our church there, there was this new young couple converted. They had a little boy, we called him Butch. He was two to three years old, sweetest little blonde-headed boy. We would carry him, lift him, throw him, and catch him. Everybody knew Butch. And one Sunday morning after church, his father was driving out the garage backwards and didn't know that little Butch was behind the car. And his father could remember feeling the car go over something, and he jumped out of the car, and he had run over his little boy, Butch. They rushed into the hospital, and he was dead. And that couple stopped going to church. The two greatest men in the Old Testament were Abraham and Moses. These two men had in common, if you examine their lives in detail, they felt let down by God and suffered more than anybody else. In Acts chapter 7, verse 4, Stephen, speaking before the council, God promised Abraham an inheritance in the land of Canaan but God gave him no inheritance here, not even a foot of ground. In his commentary, John Calvin said it must have occurred to Abraham that he had been deceived. But did Abraham give up? Well, for some reason he didn't. But why didn't he give up? Or God said to Moses, I have seen the misery of my people. And I've come down to deliver them, so I'm sending you, Moses, to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. But the next thing that happens is that Pharaoh commands the children of Israel to come up with the same number of bricks that they had to find their own straw. And then the people turn against Moses, and then Moses goes to God, and he says, God, you promised what you would do. You said you were going to deliver us, and you haven't done it at all. Abraham became known as the father of the faithful. Moses summarizes the Old Testament. John 1, 17, the law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The two greatest men in the Old Testament who had the greatest anointing were those who suffered the most. Now, what does that tell you? Now, I don't know whether you want a greater anointing. I do. I want it more than anything in the world. But then the question is put, are you prepared for the cost? Well, now the fact is that God is pure, just, without any guilt. The little chorus we sing back in England, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, good and upright is he. Now, the revelation that Habakkuk refers to is the very answer to his own prayer. He wanted to know, why does God allow suffering and even seems to side with the enemy? God is merciful and all-powerful. Why does he allow evil since he could stop it in a split second? However, the revelation that God promised would be a long time coming. The revelation was the answer to Habakkuk's prayer. Put simply, God, why do you allow evil? That was the question. And God says, I'm going to tell you, be ready. He said the revelation is coming, and it speaks of the end. What is it? word mean, end? What does it mean by end? He means the end. 
the last day, when Jesus comes, He says, on that day I will clear my name. And then the whole world will know. Well, Habakkuk could easily say, well, wait, wait, wait. I don't want to wait that long. I want to know now. Sorry, Habakkuk, says God, it's a revelation. I'm going to answer your prayer, but it speaks of the end. And you're going to have to wait till the last day. A lot of people would say, okay, I'm out of here. Thanks a lot. I'm checking out. I don't want to know a God who won't tell me now the answer to my question. It's a reasonable question. Why do you allow evil? God says, I'm going to tell you on the, on the last day. Habakkuk might have said, I'm out of here, finished. But Habakkuk had a wonderful breakthrough. And so he says, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes in the vines, and though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, and there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God my Savior. In a word, Habakkuk let God off the hook. He totally forgave God and says, I don't understand it, but I'm not giving up. I love you anyway. That was Habakkuk. One day when I was a senior in high school, February 1953, I was called out of class into the principal's office, and there was a phone call. And it was my uncle on the line. He said, R.T., your mother has just had a stroke. And uh, I'm coming to pick you up, go outside. Actually, uh, your father's coming. And uh, I said, is, is she going to be all right? He said, I think your mother is a very sick woman. My father picked me up. We rushed to the hospital. And there lay my 43-year-old mother, paralyzed, unable to speak, with a stroke. For the next several weeks, my father looked high and low for anybody who had any kind of gift of faith or healing. He had her anointed with oil five times. Three of the people that prayed said, I quote, I've prayed through. She will be healed. And one morning, and never will forget it, my father came running up the stairs to wake me up to go to school. He said, son, get up. I've got wonderful news. What is it? He said, your mother is going to be healed. I've touched God this morning. She will be healed. Oh, that's wonderful. And a day or two after that, I felt that God had given me a word that my mother would be healed. So we didn't worry about it. In those days, I, uh, I played the high school band. I'm a bit of a musician. I don't want to say it in front of you because I'm not in your league. But I used, to play the, I used to play the oboe. Did you know that? Yeah. I had a scholarship, could have made a career on oboe. And uh, our, I just thought you all would like to know that. Uh, our high school band was chosen to play at the Cherry Blossom Festival in April 1953 in Washington, D.C. Don't know how our little band got that honor, but that we were all going and and uh, my dad said, go, son. You know, my mother said I should go. And so it was an overnight trip. And the next morning, I arrived at the Union Station in Washington. I uh, went to a phone to call my Aunt Frida to surprise her. I said, guess who this is? She said, where are you? Well, I'm at a restaurant right next to the Union Station. She said, don't leave. Your uncle is coming to pitch you, pick you up right now. Just stay there. I said, whoa, 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 what are you saying to me? She said, your mother passed away this morning. So that afternoon, we flew back to Kentucky. My father was afraid I would lose my faith. For some reason, I didn't. Now listen, this disappointment does not qualify me to preach this sermon. Many of you have suffered a thousand times more than that. That's nothing. What does possibly qualify me to preach this sermon 
is that I've been in the ministry 57 years, heard every question I think that can be asked. If you were to guess what was the number one question I got asked at Westminster Chapel, as some of you know, we were there 25 years to the day, London, Westminster Chapel, and people would come in with their questions. If you were to write down on a sheet of paper what you think is the number one question I got, what do you think it was? Well, I'll tell you, it wasn't, why does God allow suffering? It wasn't. What is it that is going on in the world, or what happens to those who never hear the gospel? It wasn't, that was number one question I got. Dr. Kendall, why can't I get married? That's it, top of the list. You just thought in a theological citadel like Westminster Chapel, they all had, you know, pious questions. No, that was number one. Never will forget one, one Sunday night. A young lady came in, she says, pray that I'll find a husband. And as soon as she left, a man came in, please pray that I will find a wife. I said, wait, let me go back and get this other one. <laughs> uh, But I think the most difficult case that I had in 25 years, and for all I know, 57 years, was a German young lady in her late 30s, about 40. She had muscular dystrophy. With her German accent plus her, plus her speech impediment, and she was not beautiful. And she would come limping into the vestry and before she would leave, she would ask, Dr. Kendall, why can't I find a husband? I would look at her and say, I don't know. And out she would go. A year after we retired, uh, they wrote me to say that she had moved back to Germany and took her own life. She couldn't cope. So the kind of questions I get and got were, why did God desert me when I was at my lowest point? Why doesn't God heal me? Why, when I've served the Lord all these years, have I lost my job? Then we go to Acts chapter 7, verse 5. God gave Abraham no inheritance here, not even a foot of ground. But God promised that he and his descendants after him would possess the land. Abraham could easily have felt betrayed. But he did something that is exceedingly rare, and it's a challenge I'm putting to you today, Abraham broke the betrayal barrier. Now, I'll put it to you like this. It was a great feat in aeronautical science in the 20th century when they broke the sound barrier, when an airplane could fly faster than the speed of sound. But I'm putting to you a challenge that's greater than that, and that's to break the betrayal barrier. When you feel betrayed, God promised you something, and it hasn't taken place. I can't prove what I'm about to say, but I reckon nine out of ten, maybe nine, nine out of a hundred, when God betrays them, just shake their fist at God and say, thanks a lot, and they never look back. Maybe one out of ten, maybe one out of a hundred. There's no way to prove the statistic. It would be like Habakkuk and say, though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vines. I'm, I'm hanging in there. I'm not going to give up. And did you know that in Hebrews chapter 11, that's the great faith chapter of the Bible, Every single person there had in common, they broke the betrayal barrier. 
I don't know if you ever noticed this, but did you know at the end of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, here's what the writer says. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. It says so. What? Were they dumb? Why didn't they quit? Well, the writer says the world wasn't worthy of them. They didn't get what was promised, but what they did turned the world upside down in their day. These are the ones that it could have said, God, why? But they said, Lord, like Job, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. And so today, you are invited to break the betrayal barrier. I'm talking to that person. You're in your greatest trial. All right. Here's my premise. God is perfect, pure, and just. He's done nothing wrong. But he allows things which we don't understand. Sometimes he appears not to keep his word. Sometimes he appears to break his promise. The question is, will we accuse him or let him off the hook. Well, now, Habakkuk is the book in the Bible that chiefly answers the question of the problem of evil. Habakkuk asks, why does God allow suffering when he is perfectly capable of stopping it at any moment? In fact, he had four complaints. You, know what, you want to know what they were? Number one, God does not answer his prayer. Number two, God looked the other way when violence came upon his people. Three, God's own covenant people are having to endure injustice. Fourth, God tolerated evil. His eyes are so pure as not to look on sin, yet he tolerated evil. Habakkuk wanted to know why. But Habakkuk had a surprise surprising breakthrough, breakthrough. And it's this, that God declares us righteous when we believe his word. Now, he is now given the same thing Abraham was given. Let's go back to this man Abraham that I talked about a while ago. One day, Abraham was very, very discouraged. He was a wealthy man, and God had made many promises to him. And he says, Lord, you've given me all this wealth, but I've got no heirs. Here I am, nearly 90, Sarah's nearly 80. Am I to leave my wealth to Eliezer, my manservant? Is that what I'm to do? God said, Abraham, go outside your tent. Look up. Count the stars. It was a clear night, and Abraham tries to count. Start all over. One, two, three. <laughs> Lord, I can't count them. They're hundreds. We now know they were billions. God said to Abraham, so will your seed be. Abraham might have said, don't joke with me. Don't tease me. This is not fair. But you know what? Abraham believed it. And God says, good. For that, I count you righteous. Now, Abraham may not have felt righteous. Sarah may have looked at him and said, you don't look righteous to me. (laughs) But Abraham says, God says I am, and I believe it. And the Apostle Paul used that as exhibit A for his own teaching of what we call justification by faith alone. Except that he brought it forward 1,700 years later when Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, and the promise is you can know that you will go to heaven when you transfer the trust that you had in your good works to what Jesus did for you on the cross. And so you go to heaven by trusting the blood of Jesus. People will say, Are you serious? You expect me to believe that? And oftentimes, the the gospel is rejected. 
But there are some who say, okay, I believe it. And God says, good. I count you righteous. You're going to go to heaven. They may look at us and say, you don't look righteous to me. We may say, well, I don't know that I feel righteous. But God says, I am, and I'm believing his word. All right. Habakkuk was given the same exact promise. If you're willing to wait until the end, and it will be a long time, by the way, Habakkuk. It, it speaks of the end. It, it will be a while. Uh, if you're willing to wait to the end, I regard you as righteous. And that verse, the just shall live by his faith, his faithfulness, quoted three times in the New Testament. And you're given that privilege today to have this righteousness put to you. So it speaks of the end. Now, the problem is when God says, one day I'm going to clear my name, we all want it to happen now. Or I remember when I was at Westminster Chapel, uh, 25 years there, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Best days I've ever known for Louise and me were in London. The worst days we've ever known were in London. And it was a period in my ministry when the deacons, half of them, at Westminster Chapel turned against me. They were pretty horrible. And uh, I was asking God to give me a word. And one day my eyes fell on this verse in 2 Thessalonians. And here's what it says. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you as well. I said, thank you, Lord. Glory to God. And I felt an impulse. Keep reading. Oh. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. Oh, no, you mean... You're not going to kill them now? I have to wait to the end? You realize, if you haven't picked up on this, we're now dealing with the heaviest theological problem there is. You go to university, study philosophy, theology, it's the unanswerable problem. Why does God allow evil? Only a fool would claim to answer the question. That said, I'm going to have a go. <laughs> we start out with this. There are two world views when it comes to faith. There's the secular view. Seeing is believing. There's the biblical view, believing without seeing. And if I were to tell you that part of the reason God allows suffering is that you may believe. Bear with me. When is the last time you thanked God for the privilege of faith? Believing. You won't always have this privilege. Now is when you've got it. When you believe without seeing. Now, the biblical view is believing without seeing. The secular view, I will believe it when I see it. That's the atheist. That's the typical scientist. I will believe it when I see it. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The secular view is recorded in Mark 15, 32, when the soldiers and the chief priests said, Hey, Son of God, come down from the cross so we can see and believe. We'll believe it. You come down the from the cross, we will say you're what you claim you are. Now listen, had Jesus come down from the cross, they would have seen. But it wouldn't be faith anymore. It's only faith when you don't have the answer, but you still believe. You say, well, that's not fair. Oh, why won't God just give us the answer so we can believe it? 
he's decreed that those who are saved are those who will believe his word. Like it or not, that's the God of the Bible. And so those who demand proof, evidence, well, you're going to have to wait. And when you get the evidence, you'll see it. But you won't have the privilege of faith then. Uh, let me show you where this comes out in the New Testament. In John chapter 11, verse 15, Jesus said, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. It's John eleven fifteen. 15. Remember where it is. What's it about? Jesus had a close friend. His name was Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. One day, Lazarus became deathly ill. So, Mary and Martha send word to Jesus to say, Lazarus, your friend, is ill. Why did they send him that word? Because they knew that Jesus would stop whatever he was doing, come straight to Tiffany, and heal their brother. Jesus does come four days after the funeral. First Martha, then Mary says, Lord, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. They blame Jesus for Lazarus' death because Jesus could have come and stopped him from dying. Instead, he chose not to be there. In fact, here's what he said. Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. Now, what he's saying is he was teaching his 12 disciples a truth that I'm trying to get over here to you today. That when God doesn't do what you want him to do, it will test your faith, and this will prove whether you have faith. You see, if God answered every single prayer you ever prayed just like that, you wouldn't need faith anymore. You say, here goes, answer. Ask, answer, just like that. You wouldn't need faith. What makes faith faith is that God sometimes hides his face. Delays answer, doesn't explain himself. But for those who say, I am sorry, RT, I will believe it when I see it, and I have an answer for you, and I say this lovingly, you will one day get your wish. You will get to see. In fact, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Behold, he comes with clouds. Every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. On that day when he comes with clouds, you say, oh, 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 I believe now. I believe, I believe. Sorry, it won't be faith then. It's only faith. When you don't see, you simply believe the word. It says, John, you're going to get your wish. You're going to see him. Not only that, you're going to wail. W-A-I-L, wail. When is the last time you heard the sound of a wail? It's not a sound you hear every day. Three weeks ago, Ruth Calver the wife of Clive Calver, pastor of a church where I preach every year. In, they live in Newtown, Connecticut. You heard of that place? And uh, they're the pastor of the nearest large church to Newtown. And Ruth Calver was invited on the day of the shooting when 26 people were killed and 20 children. And she was invited to go into the fire station where all the parents were taken as they await word whether their child was living or dead. And Ruth said they would come in and say, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, your little boy Bobby, he's fine, you can go. And then, oh, uh, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Jones, here's little Betty, she's fine. And then after a couple of hours, Ruth said, 
They start coming in with good word. And the parents began to realize it was beginning to set in that they're not going to see their children anymore. And Ruth said, the sound of the wail and the wailing that went up in that room, she says, I will never forget the sound as long as I live. It was over, and they knew it. All they could do is wail. That is exactly what will happen when Jesus comes for those who said, I demand an answer. And then you're going to see him. And you say, oh, oh, I see it now. I see it now. But then you'll know it's not faith. It's too late. And you will wail. And you won't care what people are thinking then. You may hide your emotions now. And you may be sophisticated and proper. But then you will know your own soul is at stake. And all that the Bible said is true. And you won't be able to have the privilege of faith. That's why I ask, when's the last time you thank God for the privilege of faith? You won't always have it. This is why the Bible says now is the accepted time. Could I ask you a question? Do you know for sure if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And if you were to stand before God, and one day you will, and he were to ask you, and he might, why should I let you into my heaven? Suppose when you came in today, uh, we had sheets of paper given to everybody. You didn't know why you had these sheets of paper, but now I'm going to reveal why you have these sheets of paper. And so you're holding a sheet of paper on your lap, and I now would like for you to write down your answer to the question, God says, why should I let you into my heaven? And I want you to go along with me right now. Imagine what you would actually say on that sheet of paper, every one of you. Only one answer will do. Give the wrong answer, you have to go someplace else. You don't want to go there. And you write down the answer. And then after... A couple minutes, everybody had time. We'll pass your sheets of paper to the end of the row. Us, you come and pick them up. Now I've got uh, several hundred sheets of paper. Let's just read off a few answers. Here's one who says, well, I believe I'll get to heaven because I've tried to, to live the best life I could possibly live. I would look at you and say, I believe you. But that won't save you. I'm sorry, you're lost. Here's another. I was brought up in a Christian home. Good. That means you had a head start. But that won't save you. Billy Sunday used to say, being born in a Christian home will not make you a Christian any more than being born in a stable will make you a cow. <laughs> Here's another. I was baptized. Good. That won't save you. I'm sorry. Here's another. I was baptized by a Baptist preacher. <laughs> You're lost as a goose. Here's another. I've kept the Ten Commandments. Well, you're a liar, for one thing. <laughs> Here's another. I've lived by the Sermon on the Mount. You're a bigger liar. <laughs> for your information, the more space you need on that sheet of paper, the worse shape you're in. Two words will do it. Two words. Jesus died. That's it. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Now, if a moment ago you in your mind wrote anything other than Trusting the blood of Jesus, his death on the cross, or the equivalent of that, if you wrote anything other than trusting what he did for you on the cross, with respect, whoever you are, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for anything in the world. But that can all change. That can all change. 
My sermon is not over. Got about 10 minutes to go, roughly. But I'm going now just to say to you, if you wrote the wrong answer, we can sort this out. I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. Don't say it out loud. But if you put the wrong answer down, you're the one I'm talking to. You need to pray this prayer right now. In your heart, God will see you. Lord Jesus Christ, I need you. Tell him. I want you. I'm sorry for my sins. Wash my sins away by your blood. I welcome your Holy Spirit into my heart. As best, and I, as best as I know how, I give you my life. All right. Did you pray that prayer? We'll come back to you in just a few moments. Now, how do you forgive God totally? I'm rushing through here. My book goes into detail. But here, number one, be totally honest with God. Tell him your complaint. He's okay about that. Psalm 142, verse 2, the psalmist said, I poured out my complaint to the Lord. Tell him. What he doesn't like is for you to tell others and gripe about God. To he doesn't like that. But you can tell him. Second, make a list of those things that you are truly thankful for. You'll be amazed. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Psychologists determined about eight years ago that thankful people live longer. And just start counting your blessing. Third, fight self-pity and a feeling of entitlement with all your heart because giving in to such pleases the devil. Fourth, choose to believe that God is just and that he has a purpose in what he's permitted. Say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And fifth, be willing to wait for things to become clear to you. Back in Kentucky, we used to sing the song, Someday He'll Make It Plain to Me. Someday, when I His face shall see, Someday, from tears I shall be free for someday I shall understand we'll talk it over in the by and by I'll ask the reason he'll tell me why when we talk it over in the by and by remember that the devil does not want you to forgive God he is the accuser. He accuses you. He accuses God for all the troubles in the world. Don't give the devil pleasure by dignifying his hate toward God. It's confession time this morning. I'm going to tell you something that's going to shock you. Beverly, you're going to be shocked at this. Curry, Greg, Linda. I don't understand the book of Revelation. When I was 19 years old, I did. <laughs> but now, I'm 78, nearly. I only know three things. One, God wins. Satan loses. And those who overcome by the blood of the Lamb will see the most glorious vindication of all time when every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when God says, okay, Habakkuk, 
Here's the day you've been waiting for. It's the end. And God explains it. And the atheist, the scientist will say, hmm, I hadn't thought of that. Quite. God made sure that nobody could figure it out in advance because he wants you to have faith. Those who choose to vindicate him now will enjoy that day. You talk about fun. When God clears his name and we're on the winning side. And those who had to wait until then, because on that day God shall wipe away every tear. There will be no more death, no crying, no pain. The former things will be passed away. Dr. Michael Eaton says, it is a biblical principle that when God promises something but which does not apparently come to pass, you are given a temporary substitute which is in fact far better than what you initially wanted. Those in Hebrews chapter 11, they didn't get what they wanted, but what they got was so much better. Take Johnny Erickson Tata, a remarkable woman who went as a teenager through a diving accident, became a quadriplegic, paralyzed from here down. I remember saying, Johnny, would you like to be healed? You know what? She doesn't want to be healed. If she were healed back in those days, we would never have heard of the great ministry that she has to quadriplegics and crippled people all over the world. I tell you, we had her at Westminster Chapel. You never saw so many wheelchairs, people coming to get a word of comfort from Johnny. She's got a ministry she wouldn't have had had she been healed. And what she's got, she's, this is better than anything that could have happened to me. Or take Paul's thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. It was horrible. Paul says, I asked God three times to take this thorn away. And one day God says, Paul, what if I gave you a double anointing? Oh, I'll take that. The double anointing is better than having the thorn removed. Or, what about Lazarus? He wasn't healed. And Jesus shows up four days after the funeral. And Mary and Martha say, Lord, if your brother had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. If you had come, we'd have been healed. And it's your fault that he's dead. Get this. Jesus didn't moralize them. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't say, shh, if you'll be quiet, I'm going to raise him from the dead in about five minutes. <laughs> no. He just wept with them. He just wept with them. Because he knew they didn't know what he's getting ready to do. He knew what he was about to do, but he knew they didn't know. He wept with them right then. And that's the way it is with us. God knows what it'll be like down the road, but he knows we don't know. And he's touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. As the psalmist put it, he knows our frame. He remembers that we're in dust. And he weeps with us. Rick Warren says, when I face any apparent contradiction in Scripture, it is due to my limited capacity. In other words, when the Scriptures seem to contradict themselves, the problem lies with my inability to understand, not because the Scripture contradicts itself. You see, that is what we mean by breaking the betrayal barrier. If Winston Churchill could say to a battered England in the 1941-42 when Hitler was bombing every single night for months, night after night after night, and Churchill retorted, we will never, 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 never give up. How much more are we who have God's holy word in the position of saying, don't understand it, but though the fig tree doesn't bud, there are no grapes on the vine. I will rejoice. You affirm God without the proof. That is how you break the betrayal barrier. And so I'm now coming to a close. What if, what if, you come to terms with the fact 
that your most earnest prayer may not be answered. I was saying yesterday, after we had been at Westminster Chapel 23 years, what kept us there, if you want to know? I kept thinking revival would come. I thought, well, I'll stay 25. We finally gave it up. What if you come to terms that your most earnest prayer will not be answered? What if you won't be healed? Keep praying. I'm not asking you not to pray. Keep going for it. Or what if you won't get married? What if you don't get the reconciliation you want? What if the revival or awakening that you hope for won't be coming? What if you won't have children? What if those people who won't forgive you will always hold a grudge? What if the faulty verdict from that uncaring judge will not be reversed? What if that enigmatic situation that has always bedeviled you will remain an enigma? What if you go to your grave unvindicated and the people will always believe those lies? What if there will be no clarification of those difficult verses in the Bible? What if the prophecy given to you will remain unfulfilled? What if that disability that you've lived with won't go away? What if your nightmarish marriage will go on and on? What if you won't get the job you wanted? What if you don't get to live in the house of your dreams? Can you say with Habakkuk, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, I will rejoice. The angels have a word for you. Congratulations. You just joined the big leagues. You've just entered the realm of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Habakkuk, Isaiah, Daniel, the great men of history. You're in their company. All those in Hebrews chapter 11. Your anointing will be greater here on earth. Not only that, you will receive from the lips of Jesus himself. Well done. You know, a few months ago when we watched the, the Olympics, it was such a moment when the person you were rooting for wins and you're rooting for your team and, and, and they stand there and they put the gold around their necks, and you hear the national anthem. If you got into the skin of that person, you think, what could be more exciting? But there is something more exciting. When you hear from the lips of Jesus, looking at you one day straight in the eyes, he says, good, well done. Doesn't get better than that. By the way, you that prayed that prayer a while ago, because you put the wrong answer down, we'll be finished in a minute. Please, nobody leave from this point on. If you put the wrong answer down, but you prayed that prayer, I have a question. Are you ashamed that you prayed that prayer? You see, why do you ask, R.T.? Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. In 30 seconds from now, if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to stand yet. In 25 seconds, stand. You see, in front of all these people, yes. Oh, that's kind of scary. They all know I prayed that prayer. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. I'm not going to ask you to make a speech. I'm not even going to ask you to join this church. But if you prayed that prayer, just to show everybody you're not ashamed, and you might be the only one, in five seconds, four, three, two, one. If you prayed that prayer, stand to your feet right now. Remain standing. Remain standing. Remain standing.
Remain standing. Remain standing. Remain standing. Okay, stop clapping, but remain standing. Come up here, Pastor. Remain standing. I want you to come up here and see these people. And I want you to take over from this point. Because you will know just what to say to them. I'm finished. Just stay standing. Those are at your feet. It's an awesome word. I don't know about you, but I don't have time for religion in my life. You know, I grew up in a Christian church, sang gospel music, baptized twice. You know, playing in a bar on a Friday and Saturday night and singing in a church on a Sunday morning. Thinking I'm going to heaven <laughs> and don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and would have busted hell wide open until one day in my bedroom one evening his sim the simplicity of his word and his presence knowing that I had run from him all my life I was ashamed of him I was trying to disassociate the image that I have of a father, a son of a ministering father in a singing gospel family. Just trying to disassociate myself from that. Trying to tarnish my name as best I could. Wanting to do that. And I sat there and I repented, God, I've been ashamed of you. I've been, I've been trying to distance myself from you. I've run from you. And then in that moment, the simplicity of his word, I just said, yes. Yes, God. I don't even know what's next. <laughs> I know it's going to cost me something. I know it will cost me. I can't run with the same pack that I've run with. It's going to cost me friends. I, I don't know what it's going to cost me, but I just know no matter what, no matter what, though the the fig tree is barren, just like he was saying, it doesn't matter, no matter what. Here's my life. And this life is but a vapor. <laughs> and we will be in his presence. And I want to hear that. Well done. Well done. Well done. And there's many on your feet right now, and I don't know what the Lord's saying to you right now, exactly what He's dealing in your heart, but He's stirred you. Amen? And some of you, you're saying yes to God for the first time. And some of you are saying, I'm, not, I'm tired of playing. I'm tired of playing. And I think all of us, all of us, really probably ought to be on our feet to some degree. Amen? Because I don't know about you, but what he was talking about, I've been in those places and those situations. And I, I told you not too long ago, I thought I ruined my ability to even sing because I had shouted at God at, at some things. I had a list. God, why haven't you done this? God, why haven't you done this? And it's easy when it, to accept things when it's just me, but I was seeing some things going on in my family that I couldn't fix. And I was mad. That's a real word. That's probably a truer word for the church than a lot of what we've been hearing. Because it's just honesty. It's my human flesh and the reality of God. He is real. He is who He says that He is. So I pray that you're encouraged. And I pray that if there's anyone here that you're on your feet and you're saying, I, I'm accepting Jesus Christ right now as my Lord and Savior. I want to want you to come forward because we want to talk to you. If you're standing on your foot, feet right now and you say, I, I stood because I'm receiving Jesus for the very first time in my life. This is for real. I've done it a couple times in my life. I was baptized twice. Got baptized three times in my life. There ain't no power in the tub. But there's power in the blood. We want to talk to you, if that's your case. I want everybody to stand for just a moment. What key is that? 
What key are you in? Just sing this with me. I see the Lord high and lifted up, seated on the throne of my life. I see the Lord high and lifted up, seated on the of my life and you are holy you are holy you are holy Seated on the throne of my life. One more time, I see the Lord. I see the Lord high and lifted up. Seated on the throne of my life. I see the Lord. High and lifted up, seated on the throne of my life. You are holy, and you are holy. good to be in your presence thank you father for for rt and louise coming and imparting into our lives today we thank you father for the friendship that we have father as a body and as a church and thank you for beverly and curry being here today thank you lord god i just pray father you'll take this word that you've spoken lord we receive it as the oracles of god that it's your word. And Lord God, that's in every area. Lord, as we were talking about the other day, that even symptoms, I, 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 something I'm struggling with, even symptoms, where the symptoms stay or symptoms go, doesn't change the fact that by your stripes, I am healed. I am healed. In all of Jesus, all that you are, you're all in all and you are in me. Every bit of you. So, Father, I pray that our hearts are encouraged today to stand on your word, to trust and obey no matter what it looks like, what things, how things are going, whether it's going smooth, whether it's going rough, but to be encouraged. You are with us always. Good and great God, your mercies are new every day. And your grace, your mercy, your loving kindness, it endures forever. And we just thank you, Father God, right now. We thank you, Father, for what you have spoken, what you've imparted. 
Father, for the encouragement that you've put in our hearts today. And Father, for those that have st stood this morning, Lord God, for those that have asked Jesus in their heart, Lord God, thank you, Lord God. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, RT. Amen.